right, welcome back everyone. So we are going to delve right back in to our next speaker, who is Marcia Abenhus, Professor Marcia Abenhus, who is joining us all the way from New Zealand, where I believe it is very early in the morning. So I really do appreciate that you that you are here with us. Uh, so a short bio um, on, on Marcia. She's a professor in modern history at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. She has published widely on the history of war, peace, neutrality, and internationalism, including The Art of Staying Neutral, The Netherlands in the First World War, An Age of Neutrals, Great Power Politics, 1815 to 1914, The Hague Conferences in International Politics, 1898 to 1915, and The First Age of Industrial Globalization on International History, 1815 to 1918. Her forthcoming co-authored book, Global War, Global Catastrophe, Neutrals, Belligerence, and the Transformation of the First World War, is due out in October this year. At present, she is working on global history of the Dum Dum Bullet, um, and I can definitely recommend her work as absolutely stellar and really fun to read. So, uh, without further ado, um, Marcia, please. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, sorry, Anna, I am very, very... Um... Um, tired, well, just not quite awake. So I'm going to um, launch right in and hope that the coffee that I've just had and the um, and the paper will uh, get me going. I'm so grateful to be able to be here today, even at this distance and even so early in the morning. And I'm very sorry I missed so many of your wonderful papers. Um, anyway, here we go. Here's my screen. My um, paper today is um, um, something of an overview of um, the history of neutrality in maritime law from 1853 on. And really what I'm trying to do uh, here is to discuss the confluence of three key 19th century developments. Uh, the first one is the relative lack of formal naval warfare across this century. The second, the opening of the world's seas and oceans to an enormous amount of shipping, as well as to the laying of um, sub-oceanic telecommunications cables. And the third was the notable commitment expressed by all the great powers of the time to protect and promote the neutral rights of non-belligerent goods and ships in time of war. And I want to kind of unpack the confluence a little by looking at why there was a commitment to standardizing neutrality law uh, by the great powers. So in all three points, the 1815-1914 era differed significantly from the European early modern period, the Napoleonic Wars, including the War of 1812 and the First World War. In those times of conflict, the principle might makes right largely determined that belligerent rights to monitor, intercept, and seize neutral cargo, crews, and vessels tended to overrule the rights claimed by neutrals to protect their access to the seas and, the, and to neutral and enemy ports. In the 19th century, however, the mightiest of naval powers, Great Britain, not only embraced neutrality as a frequently adopted foreign policy, thereby enabling it to avoid going to war when others did, but it increasingly did so at the expense of many, although certainly not all, its maritime rights. And Britain was not alone. Most of the naval powers of the age followed suit, negotiating and adopting a range of new international laws of war that protected the rights of neutrals. In this sense, might made neutral right in the 19th century world. So as I've argued elsewhere, and not least in these two books, the great power shift to neutrality practices began with the Congress of Vienna in 1815. The Crimean War offered the first potential challenge to these uh, practices, or the first major challenge to these practices. As the first major interstate war fought between more than two great powers, the conflict's belligerence, Russia on one side, France, Britain, and the Ottoman Empire on the other, were in a strong position to uphold the belligerent practices of their early modern past. Yet from the outset of these hostilities, Britain, France, and Russia agreed not only to renounce 
the use of privateers, but also to limit their economic warfare campaigns against their enemy. Effectively, the British and French sustained only a few limited blockades of particular Russian ports, and in general left the, uh, left the trade of the world's many neutrals alone, or tried to maximize it them, uh, for themselves. By localizing their naval engagements in these ways, the belligerents collectively protected their relationship with key neutrals, including Prussia, the Habsburgs, and the United States, and kept their own mercantile and passenger shipping routes open, which is not a small thing given the concurrence, concurrence of the war with major migration shifts, including here to New Zealand, uh, the global gold rushes, and the appeal of avoiding an economic war fought on the seas therefore was clear to many. Thus, during the Crimean War, neutral rights trumped belligerency and did so very much so at the behest of the warring great powers. This is not to say that the move away from aggressive maritime warfare was all that popular, as, uh, and certainly not in Britain. As the conservative MP J.G. Fillimore explained in the British Parliament in 1855, the principle of free ships make free goods, namely that enemy goods found on neutral vessels would be or should be immune from capture unless they were clearly contraband. He claimed that this, um, this concept made war, according to Fillimore, the harvest of neutral nations and gave those neutrals real interest in prolonging any conflict. Furthermore, as he put it, it was a mistaken humanity to suppose that a nation could carry on a maritime war and at the same time allow their enemy the advantages of peace. Yet Philemore's point of protest, which came from a deep-seated belief in the need to protect the powers of the Royal Navy, was exactly the principle that many Britons, and certainly those Britons with interest in expanding their own global wealth and investments and their imperial interests, wished to protect. And after the Crimean War, Britain successfully avoided going to war with another naval power for nearly 60 years, until August 1914, in fact, when it declared war on Germany. And these Victorians um, fully understood they had everything to gain, or at least thought they understood they had everything to gain if they were neutral while others went to war. Between 1853 and 1914, then, as the American Rear Admiral and legal scholar C.H. Stockton explained, most of the interstate wars that were fought sustained a rather anomalous separation between the military war and the general condition of a global commercial peace. Stockton's conceptualization of limited warfare as a situation in which the global economy operated almost uninhibited by the occurrence of a military or naval conflict is, especially, is essential to understanding the global contours of the 19th century uh, era of industrial imperialism. For in this era of limited war, and I've purposely put that in quotation marks, um, of course, there was lots of very violent war, but limited uh, warfare in this sense means um, that these wars were uh, occurred frequently, but were almost always constrained geographically and economically by the neutrality declarations of other states, many of which were great powers. Furthermore, neutrals were almost always in the majority during these wars, and thus the assertion of neutral rights, as opposed to belligerent rights, came to predominate. Much of this shift uh, to these limited warfare practices and the rethinking of the role of navies at sea did depend on Britain. So I'm trying to contend here that the shift away from the might makes right premises that sat at the heart of much early modern maritime warfare, though it was highly contested uh, during that time, particularly when conducted by the British in the Atlantic world, shifted fundamentally with the Crimean War. In its place, the industrializing states who dominated the international system renegotiated the laws of war, particularly with an eye to standardizing the much contested concept of neutrality and concomitantly protecting their own interests as neutrals. Across the centuries, of course, the principle of neutrality formed the fulcrum of the regulation of maritime and economic warfare. Who could trade with whom and what could they legitimately carry across the seas? The policing of economic warfare was almost always done at sea 
by the belligerents and relied on the interpretation of key principles in um, key legal principles. Throughout uh, the pre-1815 period, neutral states proclaimed the right to trade unhindered, the free ships make free goods claim. Some even suggested that private property should be free from belligerent capture altogether. The United States would continue to proclaim this through the 19th century. They certainly demanded that contraband should be defined and that belligerent blockades were only binding on neutrals when they were effectively sustained at the entrance of a port. In response, and depending on circumstances, early modern belligerent powers were keen to defend the right, their right to capture enemy goods, even, carried on, even when carried on a neutral vessel, the right to issue letters of mark to privateers, and at bare minimum to itemize contraband, impose the principle of continuous voyage, and to sustain blockades by declaring them in name only. The Crimean War, we see a clear shift in these practices. And most importantly, because uh, at the end of the conflict, some of them were codified in the 1856 Declaration of Paris. Now, as Olaf Rister described them in, a, in 1965, the declaration was the most remarkable of milestones that marked the progress of neutrality, in part because the declaration consecrated previously claimed neutral rights in a multilateral treaty ratified by all the great powers excepting the United States. And the United States would nevertheless adopt many of the, its principles during the subsequent US Civil War and the Spanish-American War of 1898. Still, the limits of neutral trading rights in time of war were repeatedly contested in the aftermath of the Crimean War. Without a clear delineation of the rules, as had occurred with the Declaration of Paris, essential questions resurfaced repeatedly. Could neutral shipbuilders sell merchant vessels to the Confederacy during the US Civil War and then convert them into cruisers on the open seas? Could neutral merchants freely trade in arms with France and Germany and move them into their unblockaded ports as happened during the Franco-Prussian War? Could France declare rice contraband as it did during the Sino-French War of 1884-5? Could Japan legitimately sink a neutral British passenger liner carrying Chinese troops as it did during the First Sino-Japanese War? Could the United States cut neutral suboceanic telegraph cables leading to the Spanish territories of Cuba and Philippines and the Philippines as it did during the Spanish-American War? How might wireless telegraphy carried on neutral ships on the open seas be monitored and policed? Could Russia sink neutral prizes at sea before they had been adjudicated in a prize court as happened during the Russo-Japanese War, including with the loss of uh, some neutral cruise lives? All these issues created serious diplomatic situations with the potential to endanger the peaceful relationship between neutral and belligerent states. Clarity in what neutral governments and their subjects could and could not do was paramount to sustaining the balance of power across the world, at least from the perspective of the neutrals as much as from the perspective of the belligerents. Such clarity was also sought by merchants, financiers, insurance brokers, bankers, telegraph companies, and anyone involved in the shipping industry. Neutrality handbooks, written, often written by international lawyers, proliferated any time a war erupted. These advised companies and interested citizens on how to conduct their business across the seas and outlined the legal requirements of neutrality and belligerency. Newspapers too filled with articles describing the rules of war and the expected code of conduct, conduct of neutrals and belligerents alike, often with a focus on commercial issues. When disputes evolved, as they inevitably did and certainly did in all the cases um, on this slide, Lengthy editorials explained the legal and diplomatic complexities involved. 19th and early 20th century newspaper readers were well informed about neutrality and well understood the stakes for the maintenance of their society's wealth, well being, and national and imperial prestige. Enterprising businesses, international law associations, and liberal internationalists across the world lobbied the governments to adopt. 
ever more lenient neutrality rules to both protect the global economy from the harsh impact of war and to advance the peace of the seas for the movement of their private property and their people. So it's utterly unsurprising then that neutrality featured prominently in the negotiations at the two Hague conferences of 1899 and 1907. The 1899 conference extended the provisions of the 1864 Geneva Conventions to warfare at sea and created laws for the internment of belligerent soldiers found on in neutral sovereign territory, including on board neutral ships. The second Hague conference made considerably more progress on the limits of territorial waters, the laying of sea mines, the exemption from capture of post at sea, the conversion of merchant vessels into belligerent vessels on the open seas and the right to call in neutral harbors. Most importantly, the conference established the International Prize Court, a court of appeal to which private individuals and companies, mainly from neutral states, could take their grievances if and when a domestic belligerent prize court decision went awry. The IPC was revolutionary. It was the first international court of appeal uh, in existence. Its creation confirmed the principle that private individuals, as opposed to states, had inalienable rights. And above all, the IPC and the Hague Conventions recognized the centrality of neutrality in the international environment and reinforced the expectation that neutrals would continue to feature prominently in modern warfare. But the 1907 Hague Conference failed to do what many had hoped it would, namely to codify all the major laws of maritime war, or at least a vast number of them. Without a universally defined law of maritime law, the IPC for one could not, uh, could not sit. And these laws did, did come, or a large number of them came into being in London early in 1910. The Declaration of London was even more neutrality friendly than its Parisian predecessor of 1856. It offered a well-defined set of laws relaying the rights and duties of maritime powers in time of war, including classifying which resources could be declared contraband, the powers of blockade and their limits, and the abolition of continuous voyage. That Britain ultimately failed to to actually ratify the declaration, which is rather ironic since they called for it, signals something essential about the growth of neutral rights in the years leading up to the First World War as well. Namely, that it also inspired a fear that the adoption of these neutral rights would leave Britain as, as the world's uh, foremost naval power. And here I'm invoking Philip Moore's protest of 1855, which was a continuous, um, continuous debate in Britain from the Crimean War on what to do about neutrality and belligerency given the need to maximize uh, the power of the Royal Navy when the British Empire went to war. The debate on the contestation between neutral and belligerent rights uh, consumed the British newspaper media throughout 1910 and much of 1911 and 12. In the end, the House of Lords voted in favor of protecting the Royal Navy's belligerency and refused to ratify the declaration. And without Britain's adhesion uh, to the declaration, the IPC could not be formed. Above all, the British debate about the declaration or the public debate around the Declaration of London highlights how contestation between neutrality and belliger belligerency was never straightforward. Between 1853 and 1914, naval strategists in every major state had to plan for a potential wartime future in which their country was either a belligerent or a neutral. And given that most neutral rights impeded belligerent rights and vice versa, how to advocate for a suitable balance between them was never easy and always contentious. At, at almost every level of that you can imagine, it was contentious. Between 1853 and 1914, however, the odds almost always in the end favored uh, neutrals and neut neutral rights, where before 1815 and after 1914, they favored, tended to favor belligerent rights. Yet for most naval powers in 1910 and 1914 even, neutrality, neutrality continued to win out. Um, the other powers did uh, ratify or attempted to ratify the Declaration of London, for example. 
So at the outbreak of the First World War, Britain also declared it would adhere to its, uh, its terms, to the declarations terms that is, if only to stable the global economy and its, its uh, rights and power in it in the short term. So neutrality still defined the global landscape of maritime warfare at the outbreak of this global total war. But of course, the dominance of neutrality did not mean that all belligerent rights were signed away. Um, nor did it mean that states did not invest in expanding their naval power. The naval raises of the turn of the century highlight just how significant they considered that power to be. The key to their naval planning revolved around understanding the need to prepare for the possibility of war and the likelihood of remaining neutral. As an example, consider how the German delegation at The Hague in 1907 presented a case to protect the rights of neutrals to trade with belligerents. This policy helped its war planning as much as it helped its own plans for being neutral, not least because several small but powerful trading nations like the Netherlands and the Scandinavian states bordered Germany, all of which were renowned long-term neutrals. From a German perspective, a future British blockade, if it went to war with Britain, for example, may be surmounted if enough goods could be funneled by river or rail through its neutral neighbors. The German delegation at The Hague thus supported the creation of the International Price Court. Protecting a neutral's right to trade then was as much part of the German naval platform in planning for war as building up a sizable fleet of warships. Similarly, when Francis, uh, when Francis Jean Nicole strategists considered that a fleet of torpedo boats could keep the ships of a future enemy in port, they also supported the widening of neutral merchant rights. Meanwhile, the United States ongoing demand to declare all private property free of capture on the open seas reflected its government's and in many ways its, its subjects expectation that it was unlikely to go to war with any major industrial and imperial rival in the near future. Here too, Alfred Mayen's promotion of building up the United States as a strong naval power capable of asserting its grip on the sea, as he put it, sat uncomfortably alongside its reputation as a staunchly neutral power, willing and able to protect its neutral rights. Might, as such, made neutral right. It must be said that these neutrality expectations did not survive the First World War. That conflict witnessed a phenomenal expansion of belligerent rights supported by legal justifications that hark back to the pre-1815 years. But to fixate on the First World War as the death of neutrality, which was a major debate uh, among legal scholars, certainly after 1917, when the United States um, ended its neutrality and went to war as the last neutral great power left in that war. By fixating on this death, um, uh, uh, one risk the, um, the uh, minimization of the importance of neutrality and its expansion and the expansion of neutral rights uh, in law in the 19th century age of globalization and imperialism. For between 1815 and 1914, so many of the world's industrialized states came to rely heavily on, the, on, it, on these neutral rights to trade and freely access the open seas, thereby helping them to expand their imperial um, power as well. Everyone's foreign and economic policies, as well as their naval strategies, accommodated this essential shift. That's me. Thank you. Oh, brilliant, Marsha. Thank you so much for that. I have so many questions. Um, oh. It's not even my period, but I just found that absolutely fascinating. Um, so while, while I wait for the questions to come in via the chat, I, I will just actually kick off with one of my own. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about this international prize court and how it, how it worked? And did it ever actually come into play? Did it hear cases? What was the sort of political fallout of this? I am, I am fascinated by this as an institution. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I um, completely agree with you. And there hasn't been very much um, scholarly attention paid to it. There's some, but not very much, in part because it never sat. But it was seriously intended to sit. And one of the, um, uh, uh, and it didn't sit because Britain didn't ratify the Declaration of London, and therefore there wasn't a well-defined set of laws. But the principle effectively was, 
that a little bit like the permanent court of arbitration uh, that was already established in the Hague, that that's that, um, but for in the private companies, not states, they could take their grievances when uh, when their ships were illegally sunk or Ill illegally taken, or they thought they were illegally taken and declared um, a prize in war by one of the belligerents, which occurred a lot during the Russo-Japanese war, particularly, um, that there would be a course of appeal to a higher um, international uh, body. And uh, it was to be effectively, um, uh, it was a panel of international lawyers or representations from every state, almost all of which were neutral. So the, or the neutral lawyers or the neutral judges would outnumber any belligerent judges and there would be uh, a belligerent judge from each warring party as well present. And they could rule say, no, you couldn't take that prize or you need to recompensate that company for, um, for um, the, um, the loss of goods and even the loss of life. So it wasn't, a, so it caused issues in Britain um, on the issue of this. Um, it wasn't the IPC that as much as anything uh, was the issue um, as the notion that there might be a law that overruled uh, British law. And in the United States, in the end, there was a, there was a vast debate about it out, out overruling the Supreme Court. So there would have been issues, uh, which is the, 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 the well-known argument post 1918 that we hear uh, for the United States non-adherence to other international courts, but it was already gurgling at this point as well. So um, it needs more attention, absolutely. No, that's great. And, and then just sort of following on from that. So I was really fascinated by, um, so my research obviously focuses on the 18th century and just the beginning of the 19th century. So in my conception of neutrality, it is very much a bilateral conception. You know, in some ways, Britain dominates in the thinking of neutrality, but it's an Anglo-Spanish treaty or an Anglo-Dutch treaty. And it, you from your paper, I very much get the sense that, that this concept of bilateralism really shifts and becomes much more about sort of international congresses and actually international rules. Um, could you just, if that is correct, that, can you just speak a bit about this transition and, and why you think it might happen? Not to put you on the spot, I realize that's a huge question, but it, it just struck me as I was listening. Oh, that is a, that is a huge question. I, I think it's I think it has everything to do with the insecurities of the end of the Napoleonic era and the recognition of the need of these um, victorious states. And I would actually label uh, the United States one of these as well, this understanding that um, there is more to lose potentially in, in the world um, if there isn't some sort of multilateral, at least understanding that going to war with each other actually destabilizes um, um, interest in common. And so I think it's part of that wider Congress system, which I would say it wasn't just a European conceptualization. It wasn't just something about the balance of power in Europe, but rather something that affected um, the transatlantic um, world um, more widely. And it, plays out, I think one of the reasons that there is so much international law, aside from, um, aside from the need for individuals to have a sense of security in how they conduct themselves um, over, over the seas and in, 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 in spaces that are not defined by their own sovereign uh, empire or state, is this, this understanding that it actually helps everyone to be more clear so rather than having bilateral agreements, although there were bilateral agreements on all sorts of things um, and the expansion of uh, bilateral treaties um, um, was quite um, clear in the 19th century as well. But it was also about there are things we hold in common and these wars, these uh, particularly when there were a la large number of inter interstate wars, so as opposed to imperial wars, where the, 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 where, the, where the war potentially risked a large number of other states' economic interests, access to ports and the seas, it almost demanded them to get together and say, all right, well, it, it serves us all to kind of clarify what it is when we mean by a blockade in a way that shifts from that British 
we don't want to lose any of our rights, so we will agree to a treaty with this state in this moment for these reasons. And so it, it's, it's kind of opening up, um, opening up uh, those rights, although I still think Britain dominates um, and as it did in the early modern era as well. And, and all that goes to custard in the First World War. Awesome. Um, so our, our participants are feeling a bit shy. I don't know if it's because it's late in the evening here in Britain. Um, so I'm just going to keep going because I have loads of questions to ask you. Uh, Mike and uh, Lucas have uh, put their hands up. Oh, have they? Oh, I can't see that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, please jump in, whoever has your hand up. Go ahead, Lucas. Go ahead. Okay, since... Uh... Uh, since we have talked about this in, uh, with regard to my talk and neutrality being made in practice during the early modern period, I'd like to he hear more about these uh, neutrality handbooks that you have mentioned. Uh -huh. It's a very basic question, but still. Uh, so had the, had the merchants uh, who sought uh, for clarity had any say in, these, in the creation of these handbooks or um, who was responsible for creating them and uh, would love to just, would just love to, to work with such a handbook for the early modern period? Well, um, uh, it's a great question, and um, it was the it was the real fun part of my research was to find them. So, um, you know, I, I did quite a bit of newspaper um, research um, in order to unpack sort of the public space engagement with neutrality. And what I ended up discovering was there was an enormous amount of anxiety anytime there was war anywhere among um, among neutral publics. Um, uh, about their, you know, their access to the world outside the borders of their state, um, and the and the seas and and shipping routes and and f investments and access to you know uh, whatever uh, overseas, um, and this anxiety created a market. And so you see uh, public, not just newspapers responding, they, the, the, the lawyers write, um, write articles for newspapers explaining what continuous voyage means or what it means um, when a, a ship can get, get seized uh, by a belligerent power and gets taken into a prize court and what one's rights are. Um, and a large number, some of it's about humanitarianism. So what should one's duty be to the victims of war as well? So it's not just, um, well, it is all self-serving in the end, but it's, it's about um, defining expectations and trying to create, and also cry, trying to create opportunities. So it's also about where can I profit the most from, uh, from what's happening? But it's the anxiety, the inability to uh, imagine if the ship that's already left port and is heading to somewhere where there might be um, military engagement at sea or able to get to a might not be able to get to a port or might be intercepted and I might lose everything. Um, that's where it, it came from. They're largely written by lawyers. I don't know whether they were instigated by request. Um, but it's certainly to meet this market and they must have sold well because they found dozens and dozens of them. So um, you can find them um, pretty easily um, um, in even on um, uh, the internetarchive.org at the moment. Um, if you typed in neutrality and the date of a particular war, 1904-5 is particularly useful, um, you'll find them. Uh, they're there and they're and their prologues are all about I hope the ordinary subject or the ordinary citizen finds this a useful guide to what's going on and helps them with uh, with their day-to-day uh, -day business. Not speaking of the 18th century then. But no no. Thank, thank, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> thank you very much and thank you for getting up so early. So. Oh that's a pleasure. <laughs> I'm sorry I missed your paper. Thanks Marta. Uh, David, David Morgan Owen has a question for you. So I'll just read it out to you if you. So he says, to what extent did different national legal traditions conflict in the formation of international law before 1914? In particularly, do you see a schism between Anglo US and German European conceptions? Well, that's a really fascinating question because there's a large amount of historiography that would claim that there is this constant schism that the European legal tradition is quite different from the Anglo-American one. What I found most in terms of neutrality was that there wasn't a schism so much between the Europeans and um, 
and, and the British, but rather between the British and the Americans. Um, and it was generally about, and, uh, about interpreting neutral rights. So the reason the United States didn't, um, didn't sign up for the Declaration of Paris because they wanted all private property to be um, immune from capture and therefore um, dispensing with a large number of um, uh, um, neutrality laws, including contraband and so forth. Um, what you do see is in 1907 at The Hague, and I'm not so well read on the, on the how the scholars engage uh, on this, but more on how the diplomacy of it evolved. We did do see Britain in 1907 offering to do away with contraband altogether, uh, but, uh, and to favor um, protecting blockading rights. And there is a moment there that you see real tension, um, certainly with the Germans who, who want the exact, who don't want, um, who, who don't want the blockading rights to be sustained. Um, and the Germans respond by suggesting that sea mines ought to be, um, and the rights to lay sea mines should ought to be ex extended so that a belligerent can protect its ports from being blockaded. If you lay, lay enough mines in the, in the, in the uh, harbor mouth, then uh, no effective blockade can take, uh, take part. So there are those kinds of contestations, but they're about strategic interests and planning for war, not so much about the differences in legal interpretations. And I guess what the point here is, is, is an argument that um, uh, Stephen Neff so beautifully makes in his book, The Rights and Duties of Neutrals, which is uh, neutrality in law is often more a product of the engagement uh, between the needs of war and states. Um, so it's circumstantial as opposed to, to being a product of how legal scholars engage with each other. Having said that, there was a large amount of legal commentary on neutrality um, in uh, the late 19th and early 20th centuries as well. I'm not sure that quite answered your question, but... Um... Just to continue that, um kind of line then. You'd raised a, a number of the kind of issues that led up to the, the thinking of 1914. But I'm interested because certainly throughout the war, you see the uh, American Civil War as being such an important part of precedent, particularly in that Anglo-American relationship. And I just wondered, kind of going back to David's question, I mean, with the other three bigger belligerents, the Spanish, the Netherlands, and Norway, what, you know, kind of take on the American Civil War and the lessons, do they get out of it in terms of precedent? Do they use it much during the actual draw, you know, the drawing up of their response to 1914? And particularly here, I'm thinking, you know, Nick Lambert's book on planning for Armageddon, just their, their positioning. And I just wondered what, the, what their, their take on, on that particular precedent is. Another great question. Um, one of the one of the things that's quite clear from the longer term neutral, so the long, the, 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 the states, European states particularly, but not just European states, the states that set themselves up as um, neutrals in any circumstance, unless they're at war themselves, is that they both um, really mobilize the accepted multilateral agreements, so the, the, the Hague Conventions, and, and they create, at the start of a conflict, most of them created declarations that they announced to the world saying, we're going to be neutral regardless. These are the rules and laws we will uphold within our borders. This is the expectations we have of belligerents. And, and often they uh, exceeded the requirements by law in order to be seen to be as neutral as possible. And in some cases, like in Belgium and Switzerland, um, they exceeded expectations by, for example, they, they, they issued prohibitions on the sale of armaments during wars, certainly after the Franco-Prussian War, in order to not be seen as favoring one or other side militarily, so to minimize the chance that they might be invaded. So in 1914, when the First World War breaks out, um, they all do that. Um, and it's not until Britain declares you know, so there's this 
so it's not that they're invoking the United States Civil War as such. They're invoking many of the principles that came into agreement and being afterwards. Um, one of the, and, and in many ways, they're not just looking at the US Civil War, they're looking at the wars of the 1860s, they're looking at, at all the wars that I listed before and all the issues that have gone before. And they're trying to mitigate the, um, the possibility that they might be drawn into this conflict by not upholding something that would that they imagine would be expected of them as neutral. So it's about them balancing the politics of it, the economics of it, and the legality of it. Um, but they invoke the past, including the US Civil War and other things, whenever there is an um, there is an issue. And every time any of the neutrality laws are breached by a belligerent, they protest to that belligerent to say, your U-boat entered our waters, we picked it up, we've interned it, you can't get your crew back, we're keeping the U-boat uh, in our port until the end of the war, your crew is going to be interned in a camp until the end of the war because you breached our neutrality. This is how we are vouchsafing our neutrality for, uh, for the future. One thing I do want to say is that um, the US Civil War um, create, in the end, um, the neutrality obligations in law, in international law, were actually, um, after the US Civil War, they were, by agreement of the British and the Americans, were tightened. So uh, the Alabama case was um, arbitrated uh, in Geneva in 1871 in the midst of the Franco-Prussian War. And it kind of embedded this notion that, and it quite clearly said states cannot sell ships to, uh, neutral states can't sell ships to belligerent navies when there is an expectation that ship might be used for warring uh, conduct. And this principle, um, uh, the principle of due diligence that neutral governments had a due diligence requirement to, to police the behavior of their subjects and citizens um, came into being. Um, and it was related to the obligations uh, of neutrality and while the due diligence clause itself was removed in 1907 the implication that states ought to police their neutrality um, was sustained so there was an immense expectation on behalf of the the Norwegians and the and the Dutch and the Belgians and the Swiss and everyone else who was neutral um, um, at the outbreak of the war certainly when that war was contained to Serbia Austria and even and then as it expanded they were really, really focused on defending and protecting their neutral, uh, their, their legal obligations, as well as their diplomatic, uh, the diplomatic implications of, of their status and behaviors. Great. Thank you very much. Roger. Uh, brilliant session. And we're going to keep on that vein uh, in about three minutes time. We'll ask you to uh, come back and Martin Robson will join us and uh, we'll, we're gonna we're gonna keep on this World War One tour now for a little while. So see you all back here in just a.